This is Emily from Sex with Emily, and you are watching the Sexy Mr. Media. Enjoy the show. <laughs> Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to indie film auteur Kim Bass, whose latest film is the high flying adventure Kill Speed, which stars Greg Grunberg, Robert Patrick, Tom Arnold, and Nick Carter. The DVD is on sale in stores on June 12th. Stick around or risk getting caught up in his afterburners. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of action film directors who don't hire no stinking stuntmen in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. In the scorched desert of Southern California, on the wrong side of the law, a new wave of drug runners is taking it to extreme heights. John Strager a leader of a group of young, hot-shot airplane pilots known as the Fly Guys. At 300 miles an hour, you can move a hell of a lot of ice across the desert in a hell of a hurry. We just need to catch them doing it. We want you to move both the meth and the money. What's in it for me besides more cash? A lot more cash. Guys, we've got company rolling in from the West Hard and Fast. Drager and the rest of his punk pilots in handcuffs by sundown. You do what you gotta do to get him back. You got my friend killed. Running drugs made it happen. Kill speed. If you see only one action-adventure film this summer about Mexican drug cartels selling meth and the American fly guys who deliver it via high-speed jet prototypes, make it kill speed. I was pleasantly surprised by this new indie film by writer-director-producer Kim Bass, which will be released on DVD on June 12th. It's got a solid, compact story, a smooth intermingling, intermingling of live-action flying sequences with what I think are computer-generated pieces as jets zip through the concrete canyons of downtown Los Angeles, and smart bits of humor and self-aware jibes that make it a great joyride. Killspeed also has several familiar stars who succeed in grabbing our attention, starting with Tom Arnold as a trailer trash meth cooker, Robert Patrick as the President of the United States, Greg Grunberg as the head of the drug enforcement agency like DIA and former boy band heartthrob Nick Carter as one of the fly guys. The lead roles are ably handled by Andrew Keegan, Brandon Quinn, and Natalie Sigluti. Did I say that even close? Sigliuti. Sigliuti. Sorry, Natalia. This is Kim Bass's second 2012 spring release coming on the heels of Junkyard Dog, which stars Vivica A. Fox. And with that, Kim Bass, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I uh, really enjoyed the film. But i got to ask you seriously, Kim, what percentage of kill speed was work compared to the amount of fun it was to be around those jets for an entire shoot? Well, <laughs> since I'm, a, I'm, I'm also a, a pilot, uh, being around the planes was pure pleasure for me, even though all those around me who tried to help me make the magic, uh, it was all work for them. So it probably wasn't that fair, but that's just the way it is sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was told just a little while ago that uh, the investing, the investors on this film were not the usual uh, investors. Can you explain a little about that? Yes. Uh, Kill Speed was a very unique picture from top to bottom. The, the investors in the film were mostly pilots themselves, and it was one of the reasons they were so enthusiastic about investing in this action adventure um, movie that we made. The, the, they ran the gamut from Vietnam war vets to current commercial uh, captains for various airlines and some of the investors were even active duty Air Force officers who fly F-16 jets 
right now and have flown over in the Gulf. So you can only imagine the scrutiny that um, we received from all of the investors and pilots making a movie about flying. They wanted to make sure it was real. They wanted to make sure it looked real. And since they were the ones who were investing their hard-earned money, um, you know, they felt that they had a right to have their say about how things uh, went along. But um, it, it was great. Actually, they, they really did stay out of the way and let, let me and my crew do, you know, what we knew how to do. And they actually enjoyed it. And many of the investors actually flew some of the stunt maneuvers in the aircraft. So it was a very unique production. Now, did these guys, uh, and I don't know, were there, were there any women? Were they all men? The investors were mostly men. I believe we had uh, one or two female investors, and they were married to pilots. Ah, all right. Did, uh, from the pilots, did you get much technical correction on the, on the, in terms of what you had planned? Did they come along and say, oh, you know, yeah, I see what you're thinking, but you need to do it this way or it wouldn't happen that way? Was there any of that? Well, you know, actually not. As, as I said, I, I'm a commercial rated jet pilot myself. So, you know, I certainly understood the basics. But when it came to the dogfighting, I let the military pilots um, handle the various difficult aspects of that. You know, I, we did storyboards and then we figured out the safest way in order to execute those maneuvers. And our aerial coordinator is a fantastic, actually, uh, you know, renowned pilot named Skip Holm. He was the aerial coordinator and our lead stunt pilot. And um, he flew in Vietnam. I believe he's one of the most decorated Air Force fighter pilots alive today. And who also, after his career as a fighter pilot, became a test pilot for both uh, the Air Force and for NASA. So, you know, with credentials like that behind the stick, we didn't really have uh, any difficulties whatsoever executing unbelievable uh, maneuvers. Now, he was up in the plane with uh, Brandon Quinn, as I recall, right? Yes. He, uh, Skip Holm actually flew in the plane with all of the actors. Oh, okay. And okay. so uh, most airplanes, uh, some people may or may not know this, but most aircraft have dual controls, what we call dual controls. So... Uh, at times when the maneuvers were dangerous, difficult, what have you, then it, the plane would be flown from the right side by the stunt pilot, which and in and, and most cases it was skip home. Take control and do some of the uh, easier maneuvers. Now tell me about, uh, I, I want to talk to you about the, the actual filming in the air, but first tell me about... Uh, kind of imagining and storyboarding this, the f now, knowing that you're a, you're a, you're a rated uh, 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 jet pilot yourself, uh, I can see that, uh, you know, you would have that experience, but still, this is, not, this is not the kind of film that everybody gets to make every day. So was it more difficult to storyboard and plot out uh, this, these scenarios, or was it easier? Well, I think uh, technically, from a, from a, sort of media standpoint, I think it was easier. But in reality, obviously, it was, was quite dangerous because, you know, we're not using green screen. We weren't using rear screen projection. You know, we had jets and uh, that were doing 500 miles an hour at, at various times in the, in the filming. And then we had high-tech experimental aircraft, race planes, doing 300 miles per hour and so, obviously, you don't want them to bump into each other uh, at all in the air you, you, because you can't pull over because you have, you know, you've got a <laughs> no, bent no. wing or something. So the the execution factor, you know, kept everyone, you know, right on edge. I mean, we had we had military type briefings uh, every every flight. You know, they're, they're called sorties, and every time we went up because. The audience is seeing at certain points three and four aircraft in the air in close formation. Well, you have to add to that a helicopter and another aircraft with cameras on it. So at any given point, we had at sometimes five and six and seven aircraft in the air at one time. And that all had to be coordinated, if you can imagine. And 
while the actors at the same time are delivering lines and you have to get the right angles. It was, a, it was quite an undertaking. Um, our aerial DP, we had multiple DPs on the shoot, and our aerial DP is a, a brilliant man named Miran Salamati. And he actually invented equipment that we used in each aircraft. So while we were filming in the air, the planes are maneuvering, and at the same time, the actors are acting. And uh, my video village was a flying video village, so I had a bank of monitors in front of me and could hear and see the actors, could direct them from the flying video village. And then we actually had the ability to move cameras inside each of the aircraft the actors uh, were flying. Mm -hmm. You can imagine that. We had a microwave dish and radio signals and we had a toggle switch and we could actually pan and zoom a small, um, a small camera lens inside the actual aircraft that the, uh, that the actors were, were flying. And so it was, it was technically challenging and as far as I know, one of the first times it's ever been done. I mean, we, we had you know, we could do seamless editing because we had air, um, we had camera inside each aircraft, and then we had our camera ships outside filming all while flying. It was it was a uh, kind of a, a very technologically advanced undertaking, so to speak. It, it seemed like in a that it was kind of like a because of all the cameras shooting things simultaneously, it's almost like a TV shoot where like a three camera uh, sitcom in a way where you're shooting the same scene from different angles or am I misunderstanding it that that did happen at times we had two cameras in each inside each aircraft and then we're in the air we would have at least three cameras rolling you're you're correct and one of the reasons you would have to do that you can only imagine the cost I mean you were you know the jets are burning a thousand dollars an hour just in jet fuel you have helicopters burning fuel, you have the other aircraft burning fuel. So once we left the ground, we needed to be coordinated. The actors at some points even had to change their own wardrobe inside the, the airplanes because, you know, taking off is the most expensive part and also the most dangerous part. So once you get everybody safely in the air, you know how much fuel each aircraft has. You want to stay on station and get as much filmed as you possibly can in order to eliminate the inherent danger of landing and taking off multiple times and then the cost of burning fuel on climb out to your altitude where you're going to do the filming so and the coordination factor so you can only imagine that it, you know once we got up there we wanted to shoot as much as we could shoot and so therefore you wouldn't want to land change camera angles and then take off again just to get a different angle you, you want to get up shoot at everything that you you could possibly shoot while you were up in the air uh, were you, so were you in the, there was a lead jet, right? Were you in that jet? Well, I, I flew in all of the aircraft at, at one point or another, but um, it depends on what we were filming. At some points, I was in the, heli in the helicopter, a Jet Ranger helicopter, which had a gyro-stabilized uh, camera ball system. And, and at other times, I was in what's called a Cessna 310, which is a twin-engine aircraft, which could also carry the same gy gyro stabilized camera system and at some points we would be inside one of the air one of the aircraft um, with a cameraman getting angles you know shooting from inside the cockpit outside so I actually flew in in all of the aircraft at one at one point uh, or another in the in the production it's just so it's uh, incredible. I mean, we haven't even talked about that. We haven't even talked about the plot yet. But I want to ask you about another technical issue. So tell me. I mean, me sitting, uh, you know, sitting in the comfort of my my living room watching the DVD. Um, I'm. I was fascinated with how smoothly, you, the editing moved from the flying scenes, you know, over the desert, let's say, to suddenly. I don't want to give too much away, but suddenly you're in the concrete canyons of L.A. Right now, right. and and there's there's great intercutting. I'm assuming that there is some some kind of CGI at work there. That that it wasn't all live action. I mean, you know, when the when the the jets are turning like this and you know going through the canyons, that wasn't. Li I mean, even if it was laid over, I'm assuming 
there was some element of CGI in this film. Well, here's the thing. Uh, you mentioned canyons. In all of these flight sequences where the planes were not literally in downtown L.A., all of that was live. Everything that you see in the canyons, going upside down, down into the Grand Canyon, all of that was actual practical flight. Wow. And when you see the actors inside the aircraft going through a canyon and the canyon walls are racing by, that was all real. That was, that was 300 miles an hour through what's called Jawbone Canyon out here in the high desert of California. The only CGI flight sequences that were in the uh, picture, there was a marriage of actual flight and some CGI in the downtown sequence because we weren't obviously allowed by law to take a jet God, I hope at, not. <laughs> at 50, 50 feet you know, through downtown Los Angeles. But as you saw, the plates, the actual buildings were moving by. That's all real, and that was all shot from a helicopter ah. so that we would get the actual images that we needed and then flew the same maneuvers out over the desert. You map downtown, you fly the same maneuvers in the jet. So the actors were actually doing all of the flying and maneuvering that you see in the downtown sequence. That's all real, but you marry, you know, you composite it. So you marry the actors... Uh, doing the maneuvers without the buildings with the footage that was shot from the helicopter with the buildings and then you put them together. So in actuality, even in the downtown sequences, those actors are actually in airplanes flying as if they were going through downtown and making the turns as if they were turning around a building, but those maneuvers were handled out over the desert and then the, uh, what you call the plates and that actual footage was married, and that's how we did the downtown sequence. And I got to tell you, and that stuff was just so cool. I loved, uh, I loved the way it matched up, and you didn't, it, you didn't feel like it was a, it was, it was faked. It was, it was very real. And there, the best part was that you, you thought to have, and some, I think there are some directors who, who, who would not have written this in. You had the, you had the reaction shots on the ground, which were so important, you know, to see this jet flying by, or the idea that this jet was flying overhead while you're in a downtown city. You had to have a reaction, and the reactions were really good, and they, they really helped to sell it. I really, I really enjoyed that stuff. Yeah, it, it was it was a fun sequence. We we at one point had contemplated actually doing it, but we just couldn't get get permission, <laughs> as you can well imagine. I have to say, I'm I'm a little glad that you didn't get permission. And you know, for the helicopter flying through, was that sped up? The helicopter didn't fly through downtown as quickly as it was shown on screen, was it? Well, you know, we had a Jet Ranger helicopter, and you know, they can move right along 150 miles an hour. Right, but I mean, you can't you can't take a chance on endangering people downtown for the movie. You, uh, so you couldn't have gone that fast through downtown, could you? Could you? No, once you're as long as you don't exceed any um, FARs, which are uh, you know any air regulations, um, you know there are speed limits. But you know they expect air, aircraft, you know, a hundred, one hundred and fifty miles an hour is actually pretty slow in in, in almost any aircraft. Okay. And as long as your altitude is maintained 500 feet above the ground um you know you can go pretty quickly and 500 feet above the ground is only 50 stories and then with a certain camera angle you can make it look like it's a little lower and then also one of the other things we did is we took um cameras we went downtown put cameras on cars and then drove past the buildings and just changed the angle in such a way that you know sometimes you can fool, fool the audience one of the things that also helped sell that sequence, I think, was, uh, I think the fellow's name is Graham Norris, who plays Einstein. Yes, Graham Norris, yes. There's the cutaways to him giving uh, 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 your lead uh, directions. Uh, the, Stra the Strager, Strager right, Strager, Andrew right. Keegan Strager's character, giving him direction through downtown. That's exactly, great. and that I, I don't know my streets in downtown, so I'm not going to call them out, but the way he was doing it, and then, you know, well, you'll go down to here and then make a left, I'm like... <laughs> You're in the air over downtown, in the, in between the buildings. It was hysterical because it assumes this intricate knowledge too of the downtown streets. You know, I mean, I, it just it was great the way it was sold that way. I, I don't know, people yeah, got to see that. Well, you know, I I appreciate that. The, the thing about it is, I I figured if we're going to take a plane 
downtown and get down to the level where, uh, you know, pedestrians can uh, sort of understand where you are and what you're doing, then you have to go into the LA car mode as if you were driving through downtown. You just happen to be doing it at 150, 175 miles an hour, you know, 20 or 30 feet off the ground, but you would still need to make a left turn on Figueroa. You still need to go down a certain street and you have to watch out for high profile vehicles. Yeah, it was it was fun. Okay, so I've talked enough about the flying stunts. I think people get the get the sense of how much I enjoy that, and I think that they will. Uh, tell me about the uh, the plot. You also you wrote the film in in, in addition to directing, uh, and it's this uh, story of these uh, uh, Mexican uh, drug cartels, and they're using the, the three fly guys, uh, your three lead guys, to fly drugs and money back and forth. Uh, w- you know what kind of inspired the film? Not, please don't tell me that these things are actually happening. God forbid. Well, I'll tell you, what inspired the film was that there was actually an arrest at a local airport, one uh, from which I I flew often, and uh, one of the pilots and aircraft owners actually got arrested for having 300 pounds of cocaine in the back of his aircraft, and uh, subsequently we found out that this particular individual had actually been flying drugs around uh, around Southern California. And that was actually the inspiration for the picture. And, and I think one of the things that people don't realize, uh, the average citizen doesn't realize, is that there are so many more airports than the commercial airlines actually service. There are approximately 600 airports that are utilized for commercial air travel in the country. But there are over 600 thousand airports or airfields in the country and many of them are unsupervised untowered and if you have an aircraft you can pretty much go anywhere you want in this country and so what a perfect way and there are no there are no you know highway patrol officers that can pull you over in the sky and I thought to myself how long has he been getting away with this and what an easy way it would be to transport you know, illegal contraband, whether it be drugs or anything else. And so that was the the inspiration uh, for the story. And um, and one of the things that I, I studied was, you know, I started doing fact checking about drugs and, and crystal meth, you know, it's a horrible drug and it's prevalent. And one of the things that had happened, the, the U.S. authorities, the you know, war on drugs, they actually have done a very good job in shutting down a lot of meth factories you know, where people are cooking meth around rural areas and trailers or what have you. And so once that happened, you put a lot of homegrown meth cookers out of business. Well, then the drug cartel in Mexico filled that vacuum. They started manufacturing meth in Mexico and shipping it across the border. But once it comes across the border, it still needs to get distributed. And I thought to myself, how are they distributing this? And, and aircraft often go missing uh, across the border. Planes are stolen all the time. People may not be aware of that. And if you don't care about the aircraft, imagine you can throw hundreds of pounds of any kind of drug in an aircraft, fly it low, get it across the border, and, and crash land the plane at any of these smaller fields, get away, and then someone just has to show up in a, in a truck or a Jeep or... SUV or something, load the drugs and, 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 you know, scatter before the authorities can get there. So, you know, based on sort of studying how drugs are moved and, and, and being a pilot and knowing many other pilots and knowing that we go to all kinds of airports, it was fairly um, natural for that sort of story to, you know, come to fruition, so to speak. Yeah, it's, it's good. You know, it's a very compact uh uh, it's a, it's a fun ride, you know. It's a it's the kind of thing uh, you know any guy should sit down and and you know invest uh, ninety minutes, two hours in. It's a it's a fun it's a fun uh, fun film that goes by. I was surprised how quickly it went by. I was like, wow, it's over. Where did it go? <laughs> and you know, I, t- maybe, I, I maybe I should make a sequel just for you. I'm just going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what I talked to Brandon Quinn, one of your stars, about. It occurred to me while he and I were talking that would make a great weekly series on Basic Cable. 
You know, that could be an idea. Boy, but, you know, to, to really fly those planes all of the time, I might, I might be a little, it'd be a heck of a series. You know, you'd end up building a set and going green screen, rear screen projection. I think, you know, it, it might be a, a more responsible way to make something like that. But I think it would take away a lot of the, a lot of the magic because, as you um, so aptly put it, it, it has such a real feel to it because it is real. Those planes were, were, were really flying. And, uh, you know, the actors, they, they did a great job. They, they really, um, some of them overcame their fears, let's say, to, to be in an aircraft. There's one thing sitting in an airplane. There's another thing sitting in one 300 miles an hour, 50 feet off the ground, upside down, and delivering lines. Well, Brandon Quinn uh, uh, made a point of telling me that he had some real motion sickness issues while he was flying, that, <laughs> that, that he was an unlikely guy to be doing this role because he has motion sickness while he flies. Uh, so I, that was interesting. But also there was a, there's a guy, and I don't know who this is. You can tell me. Uh, I, he's the, he was flying second in the DIA flights, and he was always eating a sandwich. Oh, now that's, that's actor Brent Huff who is also a, a director uh, as well. And um, yes, and uh, Mr. Huff, I said, Brent, you've got these lines, but not only do you have to fly in a jet at 500 miles an hour, I need you to be able to eat you know, uh, a sandwich uh, upside down and constantly and not get sick while you're pulling you know, six and seven Gs. And um, you know, he's, a, he's a real trooper. And uh, he, he did a fantastic uh, job doing that. And, and the, the inspiration for that particular aspect of the character came from Skip Holm, our aerial coordinator, hmm. who actually um, is so comfortable in an aircraft. He's been in unbelievably complicated uh, high-speed death machines, uh, shall we say. And there's a story about... Uh, Skip having uh, been on a flight with another pilot in uh, some, you know, high G pulling aircraft, and the pilot who was actually doing the flying at the time, Skip, Mr. Holmes was, uh, Mr. Holmes was um, supervising, and one, the, the front pilot tried to communicate with the pilot in the rear and didn't hear anything. And at a certain point, thought that they had pulled so many G's that that Skip had passed out. Well, that's not going to happen. I don't think a you know I don't think a space shuttle landing upside down could make Skip pass out. <laughs> what had happened was the other pilot flew, let's just say, uh, flew in such a manner that Skip went upside down. Skip actually choked a little bit on what he was eating because he was eating a hamburger at the time, <laughs> if you can well imagine. And so he needed to swallow that first before he could talk to the, to the pilot who was actually handling the controls at the time. And it's such a funny story, but if you know Skip Holm, it makes perfect sense that, you know, Skip, you know, in some death-defying, you know, maneuver would be comfortable enough to sit back there and eat a, eat a cheeseburger. So I incorporated that in the story. I just thought it was funny and a nice homage to our aerial uh, coordinator. Well, I watched that, and while it was, it was on, the gro- on the ground, it reminded me of uh, Lloyd Bridges in the first uh, airplane movie where mm-hmm. he's constantly saying, you know, he's like drinking heavily and saying, oh, I guess I gave – picked the wrong week to give up bourbon or I, you know, smoking pot or doing, you know, shooting heroin. And I just thought, yeah, I mean, a guy eating a burger, flipping and upside down. I mean, it's just crazy. It was very, very funny. Really <laughs> and that was real. When you see him upside down in that jet, he was literally at 500 miles an hour upside down eating that burger. It's crazy. So, you know, Absolutely. kudos to Brent Huff. So, Kim, you've had uh, two films come out very recently. The other was... Uh, Junkyard Dogs with the uh, Junkyard Dog with uh, Vivica Fox. What's uh, what's next for you after these two? Well, it's, like you said, uh, Junkyard Dog uh, came out was uh, released on uh, May fifteenth, uh, and Kill Speed will be released on June twelfth, as you mentioned. And I'm now in pre-production on the next uh, film, which is called The Unbroken, and it's a, a youth-oriented action adventure western. Believe it or not, a full-blown western. Hmm. Cowboys, Indians, explosions, of course, uh, stagecoach crashes, 
And um, so that's, that's what we have next. And it's a, uh, a film that we intend to uh, begin shooting this fall in New Mexico, on location in New Mexico. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, I'll look forward to hearing about that when that one's done. Well, we'll look forward to talking to you about it. But uh, we, we think it's going to be another, uh, you know, high-impact adventure. And uh, I, love, I love cowboy uh, films. I love westerns and, and horses. And uh, I just think it's a... It's, it, you know, it, it, it's always about the story, and I, I think we have a good story, and we'd like to use the, the, um, the vehicle of, of the Western in order to tell this story about these great characters. So that's what we have coming up next. Now, where are you going to find enough stagecoach drivers to invest in this movie? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. If, uh, <laughs> cowboys are usually pretty practical, and I think uh, it'd be a little tough to squeeze some coins out of them to make the film um you know it, with the right project the the money is usually out there and uh, you know the investors in the last two pictures seem to be fairly happy so you know they may um they may come forward and, and invest in the cause and they're you know there's there's money around people are buying films through pre-sales and uh, if they think there's a good means story actors uh, distribution. So, you know, you do you do the Hollywood dance and you hope that you can bring all the parts, the moving parts together at the right time and you go out and you, you make your movie. You always have to just forge ahead. Well, uh, folks, listen, you can uh, you can buy Kill Speed, uh, written and directed by Kim Bass on June 12th, uh, wherever movies are sold, or you can order it right now at a great price at MrMedia.com. And uh, Kim, uh, do you have a website, or can people find you on Twitter or Facebook, anything like that? Absolutely. They can go to BassEntertainmentPictures.com. Again, BassEntertainmentPictures.com. And it has trailers. It has information about the film, the information about all the actors in the film, some great behind-the-scenes uh, footage, photographs. Um, so, you know, visit the site, learn about the pictures, and, um, you know, leave a comment or two. Well, Kim, uh, really enjoyed the film. Uh, delightful to talk to you, and I uh, hope we'll see you back here uh, very soon. And thanks for joining us on Mr. Media today. And thank you for having me on. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin, Here's the Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash mrmedia. That's stitcher.com slash mrmedia. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. 
Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.